Good evening and thanks very much for joining us. I'm Brittany Ramsey. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh kept the focus fully on Indigenous issues during his visit to northwestern Ontario the past two days. It's part of a week-long tour by Singh, who finished his stop in Thunder Bay by meeting with evacuees from the region's wildfires. Catalina Gillies has more. I just wanted to uh, check in on you, see how you're doing. I know that this has been a really difficult time. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh shared a message of hope in an otherwise dark time for several Northern Ontario community members. Due to the dangerous wildfires that have been ongoing for over a month, hundreds of First Nation members have had to flee to Thunder Bay. Singh took his time to meet with the evacuees, as well as healthcare workers from the region and firefighters working to combat the blazes. It's hard to imagine being away from home for so many weeks. Uh, in, a, in a brand new place that you're not familiar with. But despite that, when I was going from table to table, meeting with community, they were so positive in their spirits and so resilient. So I wanted just to acknowledge that. I wanted people to feel just uh, that appreciation for that recognition of their resilience. Singh believes there is a real threat to Indigenous communities with the climate crisis and that they often experience the changes before anyone else. He says not only are they directly impacted by the fires, the warmer weather shortens the season for ice roads that First Nations rely on for transportation. Singh says he is committed to protecting the planet and the homes of these remote communities. Making sure we commit to reducing our emissions, making sure we help communities be more uh, resilient in the face of these climate fires, so investments to help them be proactive, not respond to a crisis, but be proactive before the crisis happens so there's investments in place and communities are safer. We need to take on the climate crisis with the urgency that the, the situation deserves. Jagmeet Singh will continue his week-long tour of Indigenous communities with stops in Burnaby, Merritt, Penticton and Kamloops. His goal is to listen to more Indigenous voices and fight for equality and reconciliation. Catalina Gillies, TVT News. Meanwhile, Singh is applauding a move by the federal government to provide more support for the Grassy Narrows First Nation. Yesterday, Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller signed an agreement with Grassy Narrows to provide $68.9 million for a Mercury Care Home. The funds will be used for the long-term costs of providing care and services at the facility. The care home will have inpatient capacity for 22 community members suffering from mercury poisoning as well as outpatient services. The funding will be provided as a lump sum payment which Grassy Narrows can put in a trust to ensure that it's secure. Singh says this move is a small but positive step forward to address what Indigenous communities have been asking for. This is another injustice that's gone on for decades. Grassy Narrow is a community surrounded by water where the water is literally poisoning the people. It's something that was uh, dumping and, and various uh, other companies made this happen. It was not uh, the indigenous communities that made any sort of wrong decision. This was directly caused to them by logging companies and by mills and by dumping of mercury. Preparations for the care home have already begun with construction to start next spring. The facility is scheduled to open in 2023. Meanwhile, officials from Poplar Hill First Nation have confirmed that community members previously evacuated to Kenora are now back home. The evacuees apparently left the high school gymnasium they were being housed in due to the facility's conditions. A member of Poplar Hills Council says the community now seems safe, but the repatriation was done without the knowledge of the provincial government. The 300 Poplar Hill evacuees here in Thunder Bay are currently staying put. Thunder Bay fire officials say there's no official, official repatriation plan, and the MNRF has not confirmed that it is safe for community members to return. The nearby Red Lake 65 fire remains the same size and is still just six kilometers from the community. More fires ignited overnight, bringing the total to 149 active in the region. Now, while scattered showers did bring some relief to the effort, it's not expected to last long and could come with a downside. So with those scattered showers, especially, you know, in the Kenora and Fort Francis district, there was lightning associated with that. So there's a likelihood that we will get more lightning fires out of that. So with what we got so far, it won't, it won't be like long-term uh, reduction of the hazard. It'll be, you know, it may reduce the hazard for a day. 
Scott says we can expect more smoky conditions in the coming days due to the growing number of fires and less than ideal weather forecasts. The Superior North EMS is expanding ambulance hours within the city of Thunder Bay in order to deal with a steep rise in 911 call volumes. City Council approved the expansion last night. Councillors also provided direction for the 2022 city budget and have directed staff to study a possible ban on the controversial practice of conversion therapy. Ryan Bonazzo has details. 911 call volumes within the city of Thunder Bay are increasing every year. In 2017, EMS responded to just over 28,000 calls. This year, the service is on pace for more than 32,000. And code blacks, meaning times when there are no available ambulances left to respond to an emergency, are now a daily occurrence. If you look at our call volume in Thunder Bay, we average a 911 call now every 15 minutes. It doesn't take much for us to get into a code black situation. Uh, code blacks can vary anywhere from a minute to sometimes up to 45 minutes or an hour. City Council approved expanded ambulance hours dating back retroactively to July 1st. The move carries a half million dollar annual price tag. This year's expense will be covered by revenue from operational programming. Next year, the province will cover 50% with the city and district municipalities footing the rest of the bill. Also on Monday, councillors directed administration to ensure that all future city budgets contain an initial tax levy increase of no more than 2.25%. Council can then add or subtract from there. I see that as one of our fundamental roles to force this at a starting point as, lay, as low as possible. Some councillors are concerned that the number is so much lower than the current rate of inflation, or CPI, which stands for Consumer Price Index. 3.4% in the latest figure. So that is incredibly high. And uh, according to Stats Canada, it is clearly an indicative of the impact of COVID. Essentially, we are cutting the budget every single year if we are coming under CPI. As a Administration's initial recommendation was a 2.75% cap. The mayor's motion to lower that by half a point was approved 7 to 4. Finally, Councillor Shelby Chung's call to study the possibility of a bylaw to ban conversion therapy was supported by all councillors in attendance. Conversion therapy is the practice of trying to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. I was actually pleasantly surprised with how many people reached out to me uh, to say thank you, that it's time. And a lot of people actually don't know that uh, these conversations happen. The United Nations has condemned the practice, saying it inflicts severe pain and suffering and often results in long-lasting psychological and physical damage. Ryan Bonazzo, TBT News. An investigation continues after the death of a man who was swimming near Marina Park Monday evening. Witnesses called emergency crews after the middle-aged swimmer disappeared under the water and did not resurface. Thunder Bay Fire Rescue launched a boat search and located the man shortly after. Unfortunately, efforts to resuscitate him were unsuccessful. The investigation is being conducted by the Thunder Bay Police Services Major Crimes Unit and a postmortem is pending. Meanwhile, two people have been taken to hospital with minor injuries following a two-vehicle collision this afternoon on a busy Northside Roadway. It happened at the intersection of Fort William Road and 11th Avenue shortly before 2 o'clock. Both the SUV and pickup truck suffered significant damage, but first responders told our crews that the crash actually looked worse than it was. The incident temporarily closed a portion of Fort William Road to southbound traffic from Central Avenue to the Harbor Expressway. Police continue to investigate. The rehabilitation of the Marina Park pedestrian overpass took a big step towards completion today as the larger segment of the structure was lifted back into place. A pair of cranes hoisted a section of the walkway into location on Water Street between Red River Road and Van Norman Street. Completion was initially scheduled for winter 2020, but that was before crews discovered corrosion to the steel structure was worse than expected. With more than half of the overpass now in place, Tom Jones Construction hopes to move a smaller segment by next Tuesday or Wednesday. Once that's done, crews will re-pour the concrete deck and put the glass panels into place. That will allow for the reopening of roadways in the area, which have been closed for about two weeks. Well, about 8,500 COVID-19 vaccines were administered across the Thunder Bay District last week. 
That brings the total number of overall doses to more than 206,000. According to the health unit, just over 79% of those age 12 and up have gotten at least one dose, and more than 65% are fully vaccinated. When it comes to the adult population, those numbers rise to 80% and 67%. The Ministry of Health, however, continues to report higher numbers for the district, saying 86% of those 18 plus and 85% of people 12 and up have at least one dose. The ministry's double dose numbers sit at 73 and 71 percent respectively. There are no new COVID-19 cases being reported today by both the Thunder Bay or Northwestern health units. Well, it's a little over a month now before Ontario's schools officially reopen, but there's still no plan from the Ford government on what that return to in-person learning will look like. The kids are going to be going back uh, to school and it's going to be a, a great comprehensive uh, plan. Education Minister Stephen Lecce has promised to make the return as normal as possible. The parents and school boards are growing increasingly anxious. There is no word yet on whether masking or physical distancing will remain or if students will end up back in cohorts. The province's chief medical officer has said that high vaccination rates will be essential for a more normal school year. But only 64% of kids aged 12 to 17 have one dose and only 41% are fully immunized. Dryden City Council voted Monday night to disband its local police service and have the OPP take over policing duties in the city. That decision leaves the Thunder Bay Police Service as the lone remaining municipally operated police force in northwestern Ontario. Adam Riley reports from Dryden. In a complete turnaround from 2019 and a move dubbed as anticlimactic by Mayor Greg Wilson, Dryden City Council has voted 6-1 to one in favour of disbanding the Dryden Police Service and adopting the Ontario Provincial Police. The lone dissenting voice came from former City Police Chief, now Councillor Shane McKinnon. In his comments prior to the vote, McKinnon asked if there had been any information being withheld from Council. And I'm not looking for details, uh, but in, in general terms, are there issues with the Dryden Police Services Board, the administration of the board, the staffing, uh, liability issues, financial issues, However, costing committee members CAO Roger Nesbitt and Councillor Norm Bush stated they were unaware of any information being withheld. McKinnon also questioned many aspects of the costing, including limited access for public meetings and the city's current debt. In his remarks, Bush spoke about how policing in Dryden was inherently expensive, calling it undeniable that Dryden has the highest policing costs per capita. Dryden's cost per property is $1,040 per property. The average of the five benchmark communities that are su supported by the OPP is $583 per property. Other councillors brought up similar points associated with finances, and one by one, each councillor announced their intentions on how they planned on voting. We have a wonderful police force, but we've reached a point where we cannot provide them with, this, with the resources that they need. To know your community as the highest crime, crime rate in the province, the lowest rate of crime solved, the highest cost per household is a great concern to me. When asked on how the city will pay for the switch, Mayor Wilson says several options are on the table. Drawing down uh, reserves, um, possibly increased taxes, possibly cut services, I don't think so. But that's really not for me to say. That's, that's for council discussion and uh, a lot of discussion over the next while. Now how the city will go about the transfer and how long that will take is something that has yet to be decided by the city's administration. However, Wilson notes the first step will involve informing Ontario's Solicitor General about the city's intention to adopt the OPP. Adam Riley, TBT News. A special reunion now between man and man's best friend. For most dog owners, those early puppy days are filled with happy memories. But for local resident Jordan Carroll, that experience was soured when his five-month-old dog Tucker went missing last March. Now, following an extensive search, Carroll and his pup have been reunited after Tucker was found over 750 kilometers away. Kurt Black has that story. After 143 days missing, Jordan Carroll has his beloved dog back at home, where he belongs. It comes after a harrowing journey that left the 11-month-old puppy wandering between campsites by Iroquois Falls outside of Cochrane. Carroll knows this reunion would not have been possible if not for fellow dog lovers who joined the search. Specifically, 
the couple who recognized the Lab Pyrenees mix from the Fine Tucker Facebook page. They helped us so much and they dedicated so much of their time to help Fine Tucker and and they actually, we couldn't have done it without them at all because the Facebook page is what got us knowing that he was out there and all the people spreading the word basically. While the dog grew considerably while it was missing, Jordan says he recognized his dog right away. And Tucker left little doubt about his feelings on finding his owner. Him, he remembered us. He remembered his old toys, throwing them up in the air. He was giving me his paw. He was just, he was just giving me signs to show that it was really him. And it was very nice. Carol now plans to donate a portion of the $3,000 reward in support of six-year-old Seb Pruel, who has been diagnosed with a brain tumor. Kurt Black, TBT News. Great story. I have tears in my eyes. What a beautiful story. It's like the movie Homeward Bound.